always the funny moment at the beginning of these, but I guess we'll, uh, I guess we'll get started. Uh, for those of you who have, uh, who have joined us so far, uh, my name is Jonathan Bidwack. I'm the Interim Director of the Governance Program at the R Street Institute, uh, as well as the Director of the Fiscal and Budget Policy Project. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for joining us on what is the initial uh, webinar in our new series uh, together with the National Taxpayers Union, uh, the Pentagon's Purse Strings. Um, my co-host, Andrew Lotz, can, uh, can, I suppose, introduce himself, but uh, um, he is a policy and government affairs manager with the National Taxpayers Union. And we're going to talk a little bit more during the course of the next hour about, uh, about this ongoing series. But we do have a special guest to help us uh, kick it off. And so we're going to get right into it. But uh, Andrew, perhaps you can, uh, can, can introduce our guest and then we'll uh, start in on our questions. For sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so, so our special guest here today is Congressman Ralph Norman. He's a Republican from the 5th District of South Carolina. Congressman Norman is a lifelong resident of the 5th District. He graduated from Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina with a Bachelor of Science degree in business. After college, he joined his father's construction business uh, and helped grow it into one of South Carolina's most successful commercial real estate developers. Um, Congressman Norman served in South Carolina's House of Representatives before being elected in June 2017 to serve the people of the 5th District in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, last month, Congressman Norman was reelected uh, to serve in the 117th session of Congress, which begins in January. He currently serves on the House Budget, Oversight and Reform, and Science Committees, and he is the ranking member of the House Science Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight. Congressman, thank you so much for being with us today. Andrew, Jonathan, thank you, and, and Wendy, uh, thank you all for having me, and for everybody that's logged on uh, online, thank you for taking the time. It's my honor. Well, thanks so much, Congressman. Uh, we'll, we'll get it started right uh, right away. You you play some critical roles in the federal budget and spending processes through your service on the budget and oversight committees. What are some of your top budget and spending priorities uh, in the new year? Well, first thing, and, and again, I come from the private sector. I'm a developer, builder. Uh, that's where I built my career. And in any business uh, or any family budget, you have daily analysis. Uh, you have spending and then you have cuts. What's missing in the United States Congress is any type of cuts. Uh, and, you know, any new spending, in my opinion, particularly since we're 28 trillion in debt, uh, takes adjustments and, um, and cuts. And the, the fact that we're not having offsets, particularly with the 3 million and, and counting that we're putting out for the COVID pandemic, we ought to, be, ought to be meeting in the first place. And secondly, ought to have in meaningful ways to offset this spending that's going to, uh, it's the quicksand that's going to sink our country if we don't do that. So my priority is to try to have a meeting of the minds with uh, regardless of the party that you're in and realize the importance of balancing our budget and paying off our debts. It's not magic money. We don't have a, a pot of money on the side that we're dealing with. And, and y'all know this from, from our street with uh, the National Taxpayers Union. Uh, there's, there's, there's no better ideas uh, around that don't originate there and, and come from, from that organization. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, I think you're right that, uh, you know, obviously spending is, I, I have always viewed as the, the, core, the core issue. And um, we are, talking here as well about the Pentagon specifically. And I wonder, um, you know, my take is that as we go into the new Congress, we are going to have almost the new normal. The Budget Control Act caps are expiring. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think might be different in the new Congress, given that we'll no longer be, be under the Budget Control Act regime. And, and I guess specifically what that might look like in the context of the Pentagon's budget, given that you know, obviously the, the, the BCA cap sort of restricted discretionary spending, both, uh, you know, defense and non-defense discretionary. And so I, I just wonder if you could kind of give your perspective on, on how the environment might look a little bit different than, than in the rest of the time you've been in office. Well, hopefully it's going to be where we examine the budget uh, from top to end. I mean, the uh, base budget is $671 billion. 10% uh, of that is uh, overseas contingency operations. Uh, which is, you know, 60 some billion. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I focus on is, and just like I do in my business, my business, you break it down. And the OCO is one of them that you break down. You see where the money's coming from. We see where it's going. We uh, will try to see where, uh, as it relates to the pres president's budget, how it fits in, if it's going to be transfers. Uh, sequestration, you know, is kind of a, you know, it was a, uh, 
had some some people it had some things that didn't make sense, but it did at least cap um, the the different spending levels. I don't know what the caps are now, and the only conversation we've had to date when we have met is what to fund. It hasn't been any type of offset. So with the defense, I think it's up to us to ask the tough, tough questions. What uh, what parts of the budget can be um, done away with? What should be sunsetted? And wh where should new dollars come in? Those are some of the questions I'm going to be asking. And I, I think my Republican colleagues anyway will be. I, I haven't, you know, the, the disappointing part with me, I haven't heard the uh, any any um, uh, talk of restricting government, uh, cutting funds from from areas that that should have been cut years ago, and their attitude has been, if, if particularly with the military, any new dollars in military spending ought to be ought, ought to be uh, an equal amount for domestic programs. I just that's two different worldviews I disagree with. So hopefully we'll be having those discussions. But it, 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 uh, it starts with breaking down the parts of the budget. I'm real, you know, my amendment covered the, uh, the OCO dollars. And um, it was part of the Mac Thornberry bill that uh, I didn't vote for because it had some poison pills that I didn't think made sense. But uh, hopefully it's going to be a new day and we'll see. And we've got a lot closer with our uh, Republicans coming into the House than we had. So we ha should have more voices. For sure. And, and Congressman, you mentioned the, the amendment that you championed uh, with Representative Schrader uh, on the Democratic side to, um, you know, for, for those of our viewers who don't know, this would uh, require the Department of Defense to at least have a plan for uh, transitioning out some of the base and enduring costs that are currently in the OCO account, uh, uh, costs that, that we don't think necessarily belong in the OCO accounts. It's supposed to be uh, narrowly focus on the military's contingency needs overseas. Uh, can you talk, Congressman, a little bit more about why why conservatives like you in Congress should care about uh, both OCO oversight and and transparency and just the de the, the Defense Department's budget uh, as a whole? Sure. One, I'm a big supporter of the military. I mean, I think that to keep this country safe, to put the dollars in the right places to keep us safe. Uh, but that being said, it still means scrutinizing uh, every part of it. OCO was, was one part. Here's, here's something that, that I think we need to get answers on. Uh, the Secretary of Defense only requests uh, $20 billion. In the 22 budget was $67 billion. Now there's a difference right there of a lot of money. And so if the Secretary of Defense who has, who has the, the, the most knowledge only request a portion of what is in the budget. We need to get to, to demand answers to that, whether you are, are a Republican or whether you are a Democrat. And, um, and that's something we got to reconcile. It's been an off budget uh, item. And it's, you know, what's interesting in Congress, everything, when, when you break it down, they say, well, that's just a small percent of the total budget, as OCO is 10% of the bigger budget, of the, uh, the defense budget. But it's like a credit card. When you add all the line items up, it's a big number. So that's what I want to focus on. And it makes common sense. But you start with the military. If you're not safe, and we, we found that in so many other areas, particularly with what we're going through with China, uh, the threats we face from the Middle East, uh, it's got to be funded. It's got to be funded in a smart way. But we've got to, as legislators, have got to ask the tough questions. Yeah, I think those are really great points about OCO. I think that it's sometimes people um, merge the two issues and, and to some degree, it doesn't even really matter what your thoughts are about Pentagon spending. It's more of a procedural question as to how should we be properly budgeting. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, where your colleagues are. I mean, this, the, the, the questions about OCO have seemed to me to not necessarily line up along partisan lines. There are Republicans and Democrats who have both been on, on opposite sides of that question. And, and I wonder, I guess, a, a related question is how you think the, the new members or sort of what the new makeup might be um, will view you know, this, this OCO question uh, specifically going forward. The new members on the Republican side will be asking the tough questions, whether they're on the committee or whether they're not. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and, and uh, Kurt Schrader, um, you know, we, we, we want to work with, our, with the colleagues. 
I will tell you, it's, it's two worldviews on spending. Uh, it hasn't been the, um, I guess, the emphasis put on offsets for any new spend. But if you don't take any increases and just look at the, uh, the trillions of dollars that are, have not been offset of new spending, that's a concern for me. And it should be a concern for all Americans. We're going to highlight that. Whatever the outcome is, we're going to highlight the fact that if there's no debate on uh, you know, where we're going to offset, then we've got, we've got an issue. And, and y'all know the drill. I mean, I've been up here now for, this is my fourth term. And, you know, the minute you start cutting anything, uh, you have people descend on you and say, well, this is, uh, you know, go to somewhere else to get the money. Well, the, the, the day of reckoning is now. And I guess it came into to light with me with COVID. We've got to be, there's going to be other pandemics that we're going to be facing. This took America by surprise. But look at the damage that it's done to this country. Look at the dollars that are not going to, Going, not going to be collected through taxes because the business is going out of uh, not being able to produce their product. Um, so uh, hopefully it'll be a nonpartisan issue. The devil is in the details and uh, we'll find out. Indeed, Congressman. And, and uh, you know, uh, we want to be respectful of your time. But, but before we close, just wanted to ask you one more question. Um, regardless of what happens in the U.S. Senate races in Georgia uh, uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we are going to have a narrowly divided Congress. It's going to be a closely divided House after the Republicans gain seats uh, there in this election cycle. It's going to be a closely divided Senate, um, uh, no matter who's in charge. Do you have any predictions uh, for how the how the budget process, how the spending process is is gonna is gonna hash out in the coming months? If we lose these two Senate seats, uh, here's what you're going to see: a uh, steamroller effect with the Green New Deal, with 77 trillion dollars. I would argue it's it's no it has no limit to it. You're going to see see an unlimited number of. of uh, uh, Im immigrants coming into this country that's going to put a strain on every American that every taxpaying American you're going to see dollars that are not going to be collected because a lot of it um, will go to social programs and uh, that's how important this election is in Georgia uh, now if we do if we're successful I think we'll be able to uh, to block a lot of it but it's as you say it's close uh, but I mean, the, the downside of what we face is, uh, is tremendous, uh, not just from a dollar and cent standpoint, but just from an overall, how this country is going to operate. Are we going to abide by the constitution? Or are we going to basically throw it out, add two more states in Puerto Rico and, and DC, uh, stop, uh, uh, flood the, uh, the Supreme Court, pack the Supreme Court. It'll be a different America that hopefully will not happen. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's time for we the people to get involved. Because unless we do, and it starts in Georgia, it'll be tough sledding. Well, Congressman, we really appreciate uh, your time today and your engagement uh, on these important issues, the defense budget and, and the OCO account. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and, and, and best of luck uh, in these closing weeks of the session. My pleasure. Thank, thanks for what you're doing. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman. Appreciate thank you. it. Yes, sir. For, um, we're going to bring on uh, another guest now to, uh, to talk with us who's been uh, waiting in the wings, I guess you could say. One of our, one of our favorites, uh, Wendy Jordan of Taxpayers for Common Sense. Um, Wendy is, I, I always say, that the person who knows more about the Pentagon's budget than literally anyone I know. And I like to think I know a good amount myself and Andrew as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to have some more time to talk with Wendy. And for those of you who may remember, uh, Andrew and I actually did uh, an event back in, I think it was August, talking with, uh, with Wendy uh, about some of these issues. So it'll be nice to have a little follow-up conversation and uh, do a little drill down perhaps into, into OCO specifically. And so, um, you know, Wendy has been involved in national security issues for, gosh, I think more than 30 years and uh, uh, has been, uh, well, I guess I can let Andrew go and, uh, and do a fuller introduction. But um, I think uh, I'm, I am particularly interested to hear, Wendy, one of, one of the, my favorite things to, to hear you talk about is the history of the OCO account. I think it's, I think it's interesting that we, you know, there's sort of this, um, this off-budget, you know, slush fund, if you want to call it that, that, that has been talked about so much in the last 10 years. But uh, my understanding is that actually the account existed for a much longer time, going back to the Clinton administration. And I wonder if you could walk us through how we got to where we are now with respect to OCO. 
Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you for having me. Uh, I enjoyed being able to listen to uh, Mr. Norman's opening remarks as well. So, uh, I the my first interaction with uh, the OCO Fund was in the Clinton administration, as Jonathan mentioned, and uh, I had um, been on Capitol Hill working for a Republican appropriator, uh, and then I went. For a while, I was at a law firm, and then I went to the Pentagon in the Clinton administration, uh, which is a little bit of a, uh, maybe a little different than uh, most of the political appointees in the Pentagon. Uh, and I was um, working on Balkans matters. I worked in, um, in the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and uh, did NATO and Europe issues. And then I went to legislative affairs and the, the hot thing that was going on at that time was the um, operations in the Balkans. And the army, uh, literally, at, when they had been asking for the money for that fiscal year, you know, many months prior, they had had no idea they were gonna be in these types of operations in the Balkans for such an extended period of time. So it was, uh, the end of the fiscal year, we were actually running late. No surprise, we had a continuing resolution. And the army said, we, we were not expecting these operational costs and we need to cover them. And we have an issue with our budget. Uh, and OCO was at that time a transfer fund. And a, a transfer fund is a little different than how it is administered now, uh, but a transfer fund one format of a transfer fund is that you take money at the end of the fiscal year that hasn't been spent and you sweep it up into a transfer fund. And then that money is, is used on issues that have come up, contingencies uh, that have come up and you don't have the money for them, but you do have this money that hasn't been spent. So the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund was a transfer fund. And there was an... I, I'm going to say it was between two and three billion dollars uh, that was in the transfer fund. Uh, and so that money was used to cover the truly unexpected operational costs of army operations, mostly army operations in the Balkans, not exclusively army. Uh, so that was the first time I ever heard of it, ever dealt with it. Uh, and I was I was watching it from the outside. I was not involved in the actual portion man journey of that kind of the technical part of it. But that's how I first heard of it. And then I never heard of it again until about seven or eight years ago. And I started uh, reading what OCO, how OCO is used now and, and how it is requested now. And it's, it's gotten so far from its original um, administrative purpose that it's almost unbelievable. Uh, and in between times, how we ended up back at OCO was at the beginning of the wars in the Middle East, uh, the, the, Bush, uh, the George W. Bush administration was requesting money for the wars in emergency supplementals. Well, that makes sense the first year, maybe the second year, but by the time you're in the third year of the war, uh, the, the Hill was sort of saying, really, you didn't know when you made your budget request that you were still gonna be at war in the Middle East. And so you have to do this emergency supplemental. Why is that exactly? Uh, and so we went from emergency supplementals back to OCO and OCO has become this behemoth that it was never intended to be. So long answer, short question. That's the history as I know it uh, of OCO. Well, and that's a, a perfect lead in, I think, Wendy, to, to talking about the, the, the present problems with OCO. Um, you know, we, uh, you, you, you all have done great research on this. Uh, we've done some research at NTU. Uh, I put out a paper earlier this year. Uh, we basically tallied up the numbers. And um, if you count um, what's 
went to the OCO account, um, what's gone to the OCO account or to the global war on terror designation or to the emergency war related spending uh, in the early years after 9-11. Um, and if you add to that what we think is likely to go to OCO for fiscal year 2021, then of course uh, the NDAA and, and an omnibus appropriations deal appear imminent um, uh, in the coming weeks, if not in the next month or two. Uh, we're talking about $2.15 trillion um, uh, to OCO or global war on terror or or uh, these these emergency uh, these emergency uh, uh, supplementals uh, that, that you're referring to, Wendy. To, to 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 put that in context, it's more than three years of uh, DoD's current regular budget. Um, uh, it's it's more than the net deficit impact of major legislation in recent decades, like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or the Affordable Care Act. Is more than the federal government spends on its entire discretionary budget in a given year. Uh, you know, of course, we're talking about the impact over over two decades, but but this is. This is an account that by its definition is supposed to be for contingency emergency needs. And we've seen uh, one of the particular trends we've seen um, in, in recent years is, is more and more uh, higher and higher proportion of, of the OCO account uh, being devoted to so-called base and enduring requirements. And, and it actually relates to a question we received in our Q&A. Um, how do you plan to deal with enduring requirements currently funded by OCO? So um, Wendy and I'd open a uh, open it up to you too, Jonathan. Um, you know, what are some of your thoughts on uh, on how we uh, ramp this down here, uh, get base and enduring requirements out of the OCO account so that if it does continue to exist, and there are some of us, perhaps all three of us on this call, believe that it shouldn't uh, exist anymore, but if it does continue to exist, that it's truly focused and targeted on actual emergency contingency needs. Uh I don't know if you remember, but two or three years ago when the budget request came out, um, all ammunition, all Pentagon ammunition was in the OCO budget request, <laughs> which is ludicrous on its face. I mean, you don't just use ammunition uh, in overseas contingencies. You train with ammunition. You have to test your ammunition every once in a while to make sure the safety of, of you, what you have in your stockpile. It, it's, but particularly training. Uh, so to say that training is some sort of overseas contingency or even just a contingency, uh, it, it's not. Training is planned, carefully planned years in advance. Um, that was the request. Now the Congress said, not so fast. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to put all ammunition in this special off budget, but not like it doesn't affect the deficit. It's just off budget uh, account. <coughs> excuse me, account. <clears throat> so uh, Congress said, no, that's not how we're going to do it. Um, the, something that Mr. Norman was alluding to when he was talking about the uh, amendment he did with Dr. Schrader of Oregon, um, the the FY22 budget request uh, is, is foreshadowed in the FY21 budget request uh, because the, uh, the Pentagon gives you five years uh, subsequent, you know, which is, it's a ballpark, it's not an official request, but it, it tells you, you know, for instance, on F35s that they're planning on spending more next year and more next year and more next year. Uh, but on OCO, they have been saying, now the OCO request this year was 68 billion um, uh, or 69 billion. Uh, and it's, and so when I was well, at TCS, we go through the budget obviously when it comes out and we do rolling blogs on all of our issues, not just national security. And so I was writing the, the blog post for OCO. And I said, just for the sake of interest, what are they requesting next year? And it was $20 billion. So how do you get from 68 billion this year to 20 billion, or actually 68 billion next year, fiscal year 21, to, to 20 billion in fiscal year 22? Uh, what's the glide path for that? Because that's pretty steep. Uh, what's the plan? Answer, perhaps there is a plan, but it's not a public plan. Uh, and evidently the Congress doesn't know about it. Uh, so, 
Dr. Uh, Mr. Norman and Dr. Schrader, that was one of the points of their amendment. Let's see a plan. How do you get from 68 to 20? And it, it's 20 billion in FY22, 20 billion in FY23, 10 billion in FY24, 10 billion in FY25. So um, I hope there's a plan because that's going to be a machete. Uh, and that money has got, to, either it doesn't need to be spent at all. And that would certainly give us a clue on uh, you know, the, the problems with OCO, or it does need to be spent. And that means something's got to go. As Mr. Norman said, the reckoning is coming. Something's got to go in the base budget. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a really great point, and I will uh, I will answer Andrew's question with what will eventually turn into a, a further question for Wendy. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, OCO as a mechanism. I mean, I think that the overseas contingency operations budget there's sort of the there's the stated purpose, and then there is what the real purpose is. And so the stated purpose, as we all know, is that it's for these contingencies, these emergencies that we didn't foresee. Um, in practice, what's become obvious, I think, to those of us who engage in these budgeting questions over the last decade, um, is that really it's been this sort of alternative spigot from, you know, separate from the underlying base budget of the Pentagon. And so because the Budget Control Act caps were in place and restricted the, the overall level of discretionary spending and specifically imposed limits on uh, the Pentagon's budget as well as the non-defense discretionary, um, there was sort of this alternative way devised to increase spending in the defense arena um, or offensive arena um, beyond the the underlying base budget, and so that was OCO, and that was the reason why OCO budgets were were increased, you know, dramatically. It wasn't like there weren't emergencies prior to the existence of the Budget Control Act. So. Given that, though, you know, I asked the question of Congressman Norman about, well, now the Budget Control Act is going away. And so I wonder, uh, Wendy and, and Andrew, what both your thoughts are on um, how important is OCO going forward if you accept that a big part of, of its role has really not been specifically to deal with emergencies, but really as this alternative budgeting technique. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of our organizations and, and have put in a lot of you know, effort into reforming OCO and frankly, uh, you know, having full accountability for the funds that are being spent in, in the OCO budget. Um, but I wonder if, if that debate is uh, no longer necessary or becoming less important because the thing that pushed OCO to become such a major uh, account with the budget control act caps are, are now going away. So are we, I guess my, my question is, are we, are we missing the boat uh, by, by focusing on OCO and uh, rather than talking about the, the total top line? Okay, who's going first, Andrew, you or me? You, you, you go first, Wendy, I'll follow. All right. Uh, I, I think the, I'm gonna answer it in, in what about the BCA? Uh, I, I think that the, the BCA forced Congress to think more about budgets and to think about deficits and to think about trade-offs. It wasn't the kind of trade-offs that maybe our organizations would have wholeheartedly applauded, but it, it made them talk about it. I mean, our organizations and, and many other organizations in Washington talk about deficit spending all the time. Uh, and it, it has, however, fallen out of favor or seems to have fallen out of favor on the Hill to really worry about deficit spending. Uh, that worries me that we're not talking about it, uh, elevating the issue enough. So I think that the BCA did that. Uh, the, the, I think as we go forward and if OCO truly goes down to 20 billion in, and, and what, what is that 20 billion? What does it consist of? Uh, and um, is there going to be a, a boost of 40 to 50 billion in base budget next year because OCO is going down to 20 billion. You know, we're, we're all guessing at this point and we'll know when the FY22 budget request comes out. But I think one of the things it did to help us 
uh, in, in the past few years is that the budget squabbles were not as drawn out uh, because there were caps and everybody had agreed to those caps. They were circumvented for DOD, but um, they, it, it, it drove down the length of time that, that people argued about it because there was a deal. Um, <clears throat> if the Senate remains in Republican hands, uh, I think the squabbles are going to be much more drawn out. If the Senate uh, flips, uh, it's going to be an extremely close Senate and it's, we're still gonna have more drawn out budget squabbles. So I think the, the fact that we're talking about deficits and debt again is a good thing. Uh, and there will be some push for restraint. I think you will find more uh, members talking about the horrors of the deficit in the next two years than we have heard probably for the last six or eight years. Yeah, I'd agree with everything you said, Wendy. Um, uh, and, and going back to your question, Jonathan, does the OCO account still matter? I, I would fiercely argue it does, and for a few reasons. Um, uh, the first is, sort of goes back to the example you were bringing up, Wendy, about ammunition. There's still potential for gamesmanship in the OCO account, if, as long as it continues to exist, even if it exists at a level around 15 or $20 billion. Uh, per year um, or 25 billion per year, um, there's still the potential for gamesmanship. Uh, and part of that has to do with the fact that we don't have a clear sense of, um, we don't have a clear sense uh, of the guidelines that the Office of Management and Budget and the Department of Defense are using uh, when they budget, when, when, when they, when they uh, make their budget requests for OCO. Uh, part of that is a problem that we've pointed out before that the criteria which DOD and OMB are using to build their OCO budget request is 10 years old and hasn't been updated since 2010. And, and it doesn't take a military expert to know that the nature of our, our, our uh, contingency needs overseas has changed uh, since 2010. Uh, it's, we're, we're going on year 20, 2021 now. Uh, it's been 11 years since since the criteria were last updated. So that's something that we've been, you know, sort of pushing both Congress and the incoming Biden-Harris administration on. Um, the the uh, second element of this is that even when the money goes out the door, again, even if it's just 15 or $20 billion, and, you know, it's easy for us in Washington to say, well, just 20, 15 or $20 billion, but, um, you know, even after that money goes out the door, uh, we need to be sure that it's being spent wisely and properly. Um, and that's why I think all of our organizations, I, I, I can't speak for you all, but I believe that we've all supported efforts in the past from Congressman uh, Jody Heiss in Georgia and Stephen Lynch in Massachusetts to reauthorize the Wartime Contracting Commission, uh, which uh, in its heyday uh, in the mid 2000s looked into waste in contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And if reauthorized, so actually to go back for a second, when they looked at waste and fraud and abuse in contracting in, in Iraq and Afghanistan over three years, they found uh, between 60 and $80 billion worth, worth of waste. Uh, um, you know, if they were to be reauthorized, they would have a mandate to look into contracting waste and fraud and abuse uh, in uh, overseas contingency operations spending and in contracts uh, spending on the current authorizations for use of military force. Uh, and these are efforts that um, have been proposed in Congress before, but haven't made it across the finish line. We're still hopeful that the, the Norman Schrader Amendment will make it through the final version of the NDAA. I know we're all eagerly watching that in the coming days as, as NDAA finishes up its conference process, but um, I am, uh, I, I am uh, encouraged that, that these additional ideas um, you know, th there's a lot of work left to do on the OCO account, even if it does start to wind down. Uh, and it's certainly not the only fight we're going to have about the DOD uh, budget, but um, uh, it's still an important one to have. And if I can just add, uh, when I personally decided that or felt that OCO had become irretrievably a slush fund uh, from a, a proper beginning to uh, nonsense was when military construction projects started getting being put in the OCO account. I mean, the, the antithesis of a contingency is when you're building something, right? You know, if you're putting down a runway, 
if you're building a, you know, a dormitory, it's probably not a contingency anymore. Uh, and that was uh, six, seven, eight years, six or seven years ago. Uh, and Mr. Norman's predecessor, Mr. Mulvaney, uh, offered an amendment with Mr. Van Hollen uh, that was successful to strip all the Milcon out uh, of the OCO in the Milcon Appropriations Bill, to strip the Milcon projects out of the OCO um, title of the bill. It's just ludicrous that you would say, yes, military construction is definitely a contingency. It was all overseas, I will give them that. They weren't trying to build anything in Norfolk with OCO funds. Uh, you know, it was in another country, but it was crazy. Uh, and you know, when you, that's just an abuse of the, of the willingness uh, of Congress to indulge or the past willingness of Congress to indulge this off budget account. Sure. Um, and um, real quick, uh, you know, for anyone who's on and wants to ask a, a question, uh, if you go to the, the bottom right corner uh, of your Zoom screen, you should see a Q&A box. Uh, we're happy to answer any of your questions uh, as we still have some time left here in our discussion. But um, Wendy, I kind of want to zoom out. Um, uh, you know, we are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are mere days, potentially mere hours away from uh, seeing the final text of this NDAA. Um, there are provisions that our organizations are fighting uh, to keep in there. There are provisions certainly that our organizations have fought to try and uh, 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 keep out or at least um, uh, oppose. Uh, Wendy, and I wanna hear it from you too, Jonathan. Um, are you, what are you optimistic about in this NDA? If anything, it's hard to be optimistic uh, with, with another $750 billion authorization. Uh, what are you optimistic about? What are you pessimistic about? Um, and, and what fights do you think, uh, what are some of the fights uh, that you think will remain uh, for organizations like ours in the FY 2022 NDA? Because believe it or not, in another few months, we'll be back negotiating that. Wendy, uh, your thoughts? Uh, I will say that I'm optimistic that um, uh, the both bills, the House and the Senate bill, seem to be pretty serious about oversight, excuse me, oversight. Uh, and so I think that that's a net plus. Uh, there is, there are um, uh, lots of provisions that uh, require, I mean, and not just studies. I mean, you know, gosh, it, when I was in the Pentagon in legislative affairs toward the end of my time in the Pentagon, you know, the, the list, we kept tables of all the studies that have been requested in the, in each of the bills, our House and Senate Armed Services, House and Senate Appropriations. And you know, it was pages and pages of requests for studies. So not just studies, but, but uh, more um, uh, definitive decision-making saying, no, you're, you're gonna do it this way, or, or you know, you're not gonna do it that way. Now, some of this takes, an, for taxpayers for common sense, takes a, a, an unfortunate turn when um, in particular this year, it seems to be the Air Force, when the Air Force is trying to divest itself of older models of aircraft or, or entire lines of aircraft. Uh, and Congress says, no, 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 no divesting yourself of, you know, and, uh, uh, there's a list on our website at taxpayer.net. Uh, if you look at our NDAA analysis, you'll find it. Uh, uh, you know, no, you can't divest yourself of uh, uh, any, you, you must have at least 50 KC-10s. Uh, you can't divest yourself of any KC-135s through FY23. Uh, you know, J-STARS, RC-12, or RC-125. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of that. No, no, can't stop that. Can't stop spending money on that. Uh, can't modernize away from the, the type that is built in my district or is stationed in my district. So unfortunately, there's a lot of that in both the House and Senate versions of the bill. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Senate Armed Services Committee um, is, uh, has, wants to establish a Pacific Deterrence Initiative uh, on the model of the European Deterrence Initiative which has been around since uh, toward the end of the Obama administration. Uh, it's uh, 
Now, keeping in mind that the authorizers can't actually uh, cause money to be spent, only the appropriators can, the authorizers put in 1.4 billion um, if the appropriators agree to it uh, in FY21 for the Pacific, Deter Pacific Deterrence Initiative out of the OCO account, as far as I can tell. The European Deterrence Initiative is out of the OCO account. Uh, I believe Pacific Deterrence Initiative is similarly funded. Uh, and, and then they tell, the, the Senate Armed Services Committee tells the Pentagon to request 5.5 billion in, in FY22 or up to 5.5 billion in FY22. Again, only the appropriators can actually uh, cause money to be spent. But, and I thought it was very interesting that they would say, by the way, next year request up to 5.5 billion. Uh, so there's a lot to be unhappy about, um, but overall I'm pleased to see a robust oversight. Uh, let's see what Jonathan thinks. <laughs> well, I will agree with that. So perhaps uninteresting in that regard. Um, I will say, I'll go even, even higher level and say that um, I think what gives me some form of optimism is the degree of discussion that is occurring both among members of Congress and staff and also outside organizations. Um, it's very easy to forget that, you know, literally 10 years ago, the NDAA was often passing by voice vote in both chambers and there was really no actual discussion about it. And, you know, from the standpoint of a fiscal conservative, that's problematic in much the same way that when we talk about, you know, omnibus appropriations, it's problematic, right? You have an up or down vote, you either approve everything or you disprove everything, that's it. Um, so I do think there is a lot more conversation that is happening today uh, around these issues. And there's just generally a lot more awareness. And frankly, um, that discussion is occurring across the aisle. I mean, you know, certain, some of these questions are partisan, but some of them are not. I mean, as, as I you know mentioned when we were speaking with Congressman earlier, I mean, you know, the, the discussion over OCO is actually not that partisan. There may be a little bit of a skew, but, um, but there are Republicans on both sides who are, uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats on, uh, who are supportive of, of OCO. There are Republicans and Democrats who oppose OCO. And so, um, you know, that's also encouraging because I don't think these should be partisan issues. What we're really debating is what is the best way to keep this country safe. And for a long time, the presumption was that the best way to do so was to just spend more money. And as fiscal conservatives, you know, we don't really accept that logic when we're talking about it in the context, for example, of the Department of Education or, you know, pick other government departments. But there was this sort of mantra that existed for a long time where, um, that, w that went unchallenged, uh, that basically said, if we spend more, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have better national defense. And I think there's a far more robust conversation going on generally, and also you know, in, in the context of, of the NDAA and, um, and defense appropriations. So uh, I'm encouraged that we'll continue. Now, the results aren't always necessarily what I might like to see. I think there are obviously a lot of things in, uh, in these bills that are, that are discouraging from the standpoint of a fiscal conservative, but um, but it's, it's, it's come a long way, and I think it's important to, to recognize that, which does kind of lead me into my, my next question, which you know, I suppose you both can answer with respect to, to OCO specifically or uh, Pentagon spending more broadly. And I guess you could sum up my question as just you know, who is to blame, um, or depending on your perspective, you know, who is responsible for the status quo? Because there are a lot of ways that we talk about this. I mean, there are, there are people who put all the blame on Republicans. There are people who put the blame on Democrats. There are, um, you know, the argument being that Republicans tend to be uh, defense hawks and so just want to always spend more. Um, the argument against Democrats being that they don't really want to, they don't really care about this issue. They just care about increasing spending elsewhere. And so they're willing to accept more spending in the Pentagon space as a result of that. Um, I think there is also a lot of blame that ends up being put, I would argue unfairly on you know, military commanders or the branches of, of the armed services or even the Pentagon itself. Um, you know, we often see the Pentagon request one sum of money, which then ends up being increased by the president and then increased even more by the, you know, by the uh, Congress. And so everyone kind of um, you know, adds to what is actually even being requested by members of the Pentagon, at the Pentagon. Um, but, you know, I wonder, is there, where does the blame lie in, in, in that space? So, uh, and then of course, there's just, you know, across time, I mean, you know, you mentioned OCO, you know, in particular was being increased, um, you know, or plussed up by initially the Bush administration and then continued and was expanded under the Obama administration and largely continued under the Trump administration and it remains to be seen what will happen going forward. But um, so I wonder if, if either of you can help us understand these kind of competing viewpoints and 
you know, uh, again, you could sort of frame it as where do you put the blame, but I think the, I think the bigger question is, you know, what, it, what are the dynamics that are really at play that have gotten the Pentagon's budget uh, at large and, and OCO specifically um, to the position that we're at now? I say Andrew Lotz. Andrew Lotz is to oh. blame. I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> no, Andrew, you go first this time. I'll follow up. All right. Um, you know, at, at the risk of 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 making this sound like a, a bit of a a bit of a cop out, uh, I, I blame I blame a lack of 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 creative framing on this issue uh, across the board uh, in media, uh, among military officials, uh, among members of Congress. Um, and, and this comes with a bias. Uh, it's I, I haven't talked about this often, but I come from, uh, b before I joined NTU, I mostly uh, worked on political campaigns. Um, and man, if for anyone who has worked on a political campaign before, or been part of a political campaign, uh, the the environment is just brutal in, in that your political opponents um, are looking for for any any possible opportunity to spin something that that you as a candidate or as an elected official do as a weakness. And for too long, the framing, uh, I, I think by political opponents and, and picked up in media is that um, uh, not only just a cut to uh, the Pentagon budget, but uh, slower growth to the Pentagon budget is a sign that that member X or Senator Y is, is, is voting for weakness. Uh, they're voting to make us weaker, to make us less safe. And I think, um, I think the pandemic has really, um, uh, it, jolted that perception for, for people, or I hope it has in, in, in a way, uh, as, as terrible as, as this has been. I hope people, I hope more folks across the ideological spectrum and, and folks not in politics, folks in media uh, or, or in, you know, career officials in the government realize that, um, you know, uh, safety is not purchased with more weapons or more subs or more, uh, more aircraft. Um, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, I think all of our organizations take a pragmatic approach to um, uh, right sizing the Pentagon budget. It's not a slash and burn strategy that's not only never going to work, but it's never going to be passed uh, on, on a bipartisan basis in Congress or advanced by uh, by military officials. So we, we can't slash and burn the Pentagon budget just like we can't necessarily slash and burn any part of the budget. But all of our organizations care about reducing the federal budget, about reducing the Pentagon budget. And um, hopefully, hopefully one of the things that, that comes out of this sort of new political era that we're entering here is a reframing um, of, of, of what it means to be safe and secure um, uh, that applies to conservatives, liberals, moderates, uh, really any point in the ideological spectrum. Uh, I could make a fierce case to, to, um, to conservatives uh, or to progressives that, you know, um, more spending on um, this or that or the next priority uh, doesn't necessarily make us safer or more secure. Uh, that that goes especially so, I think, for for the Pentagon. And uh, I, I know that's uh, maybe more abstract and a little less uh, specific than you were looking for, Jonathan. But but I think messaging is a big part of the problem. I agree with uh, Andrew on this. I think it has been a, an extremely effective cudgel to say you're being weak on, you know, you go back enough years, you're being weak, soft on the Soviets, you know, you're being weak on communism, you're, you know. Uh, I reject the notion that Democrats cannot be defense hawks. There are plenty of Democrats who are defense hawks. Uh, but the, you are weak on X, on, on any kind of defense issue has been a very effective cudgel. It is definitely used in campaigns. Um, but I expected when, when DHS was brought into existence, I thought D DHS spending, D yes, DHS spending would have a similar um, uh, argument made about it. And really with the exception of very recently with regards to border barriers, it really has not. I think it's very interesting that 
homeland security spending if you are for a uh, you know one percent haircut of and DHS funding or you're for reducing you know a program that has been proved to be less than effective you are somehow not considered some weak need willy nilly I don't care about the country kind of person uh, so uh, from a messaging standpoint we need to to get back to a, a time when defense spending, uh, when thoughtful arguments about defense spending were not considered weakness. Uh, and anybody who has worked in the Pentagon knows that there are, are areas of wasteful spending. You know, you, can't, you cannot be in an organization that large that spends that much money and not have some waste. The waste is there. It is not always easily identifiable, but when you find it, it, it should be cut. Uh, and that's basically the taxpayers for common sense mantra. It's the R Street mantra. It's the NTU mantra. Uh, now, if we could just get everybody to come along with us. That's what these podcasts are for. Exactly. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, it, you, you, you go to, um, you know, this sort of this discussion of cuts, I think one thing, um, you know, I'm biased, but, but one thing that I think all of our organizations uh, do well is recognizing that it's not enough to, it's not enough to just say cut. It's not, and, and it's not enough to say, well, we're going to have an X percent across the board um, uh, cut. I, I think it's a responsibility for, for, taxpayer advocates like like us um, for our organizations where we have expertise and resources to um, to try and, and point our friends in Congress uh, and in, in various administrations in the right direction uh, uh, to offer up specific opportunities for reform. I, I think of, you know, it, Wendy, you mentioned that, that, you know, everyone in the Pentagon knows that there are, are areas of waste. Um, the, the sort of famous or infamous Defense Business Board report from 2015 uh, identified, it, it came from within the Pentagon and identified $125 billion uh, uh, in potential uh, savings uh, for the Pentagon over that, that could be enacted over the course of five years. And if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the report was buried and, and would have stayed buried if not for a Washington Post report that sort of brought it to light and to... to um, to Congress's credit, you now have members, both Republican and Democratic members, who are still interested five years later, six years later in that report and making sure that the recommendations contained in that report are, are either eventually acted upon or if they're not acted upon, that, that the Defense Business Board and other elements of the Pentagon you know, continue to uh, examine opportunities for, for, for savings and reform. So, um, you know, I don't know, uh, th there's not really a question that accompanies that, but I don't, you know, in these closing minutes, I don't know if either of you have thoughts on, on how we sort of put pen to paper and, and go beyond just saying, cut, cut, cut. I want to point out the cognitive dissonance that I have been finding. You know, one of the things that we do at Taxpayers is we read the documents, we read the reports, we read every general provision in the appropriations bills, and we pull out those little details. Um, the House Armed Services Committee in the last uh, two months released a committee review, a bipartisan committee review of, um, of Pentagon strategy and spending uh, going forward. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of that report. Uh, but they, one of the big takeaways from that report was emerging technologies have to be prioritized. And they say in the report, of course, emerging technology, we have to pay for that. And we, the cost, some of the costs of prioritizing emerging technologies, which is of course never cheap, is by retiring legacy systems. That's the House Armed Services Committee bipartisan report and the House Armed Services Committee NDAA report said, you can't retire this, you can't retire that, you can't retire that, uh, you can't drop down to fewer than you know, 50 airframes of this. So, you know, and, and the two things came out eight weeks apart, something like that. Uh, I, it, <laughs> it's um, interesting when you actually read the details and pull it out and write about it and say, how did we get here in June and 
here in October? You know, how does the right hand talk, speak to the left hand at all? I mean, that's one committee, much less the House on one side and the Senate on the other side, or the authorizers on one side and the appropriators on the other side. It's one committee and it's bipartisan. Both reports are bipartisan. It was very interesting to me. So always, yeah. always something to write about. I think there are there are probably more examples like that that we could uh, that we could uh, list off. I will um, I will answer your your question, Andrew, to, just to reference something you said earlier. I mean, you know, I am um, I am not interested in like cutting for cutting sake, right? I think that that's sort of the uh, that's sort of the the assumption that a lot of people make that if you're fiscally conservative, uh, that you somehow just want to cut. That's your that's your goal. But that you know, I'm. I'm not Ron Swanson, actually, much as I do, you know, worship the, the pyramid of greatness. I think, uh, you know, for me, the really what I want is, is responsibility. And if that requires more spending uh, or more spending on certain things, um, I am actually very much open to that, uh, to, to those sorts of reprioritizations. Um, and, but it's sort of like, you know, present the plan. It's the, um, you know, it's the, it's the uh, I, I guess, with respect to the Pentagon spending, you know, my attitude is always, it's, it's the Reagan line, right? Trust but verify, or I guess the Russian proverb that underlies. So, so to me, it's kind of trust but verify. You know, the, the goal should be to put forth a plan um, that, that, you know, which, which we do, and then fund that, you know, d determine the appropriate level of funding for, to accomplish the objectives that we lay out. But too often, what, what happens in the Pentagon context, in my experience, is actually in reverse. There's sort of this assumption that we spent X last year, so this year we have to spend X plus 50. And then let's figure out on the back end how we're going to distribute all of that, all of that funding to all the various things that we're doing, whether they are things that are absolutely critical to our national defense, or whether they're things that are completely unrelated, you know, the legacy type programs that Wendy was talking about. And so I think that that is the that mindset is the one that I find to be the most toxic is the the presumption that that more spending is is on its face. Uh, you know, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. It, it, it you know breeds more safety. Actually, it, it, that may be the case if you have a, a reasonable plan. But you can imagine it's the old Milton Friedman line, right? About you can just kind of you know dump money into the, into the pit, right? You're not really you're not really doing anything. If you're spending all that money building that building that pit, you're not actually doing anything constructive. So the core question is, are we doing something that is fundamentally constructive? And if so, then then I think most people, regardless of where they fall on the political spectrum, would agree that we should spend money on it. But uh, unfortunately, that hasn't been the way that people have you know approached this issue, and, and and a lot of it comes back to what we talked about earlier, the the demagoguery that's existed in the political context, and um, you know, and it's something that's gone on, on on both sides. So you know, that of course is the purpose for this podcast to have these kinds of discussions and uh, and talk about different angles and and sort of have it be driven by um, you know by a real discussion about whether or not we are making policy decisions that are ultimately in, in, in the Pentagon context, um, you know, making us safer and 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 truly rooted in in what I would characterize as as true national defense rather than um, you know phony or or illusory national defense. So um, those are my closing remarks. I don't know Andrew or, or Wendy if you all have anything uh, you'd, you'd like to add before we uh, before we close up. Oh, well said. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your inaugural event. Thank you, Wendy. And and yes, uh, just for any for anyone who's still on, this is the first in in uh, a series of at least eight monthly webinars that we're going to be doing. We're going to cover a lot of interesting topics, um, touching the the massive defense budget and defense department uh, beyond just the OCO account. Um, uh, we're we're really looking forward to it. If you have any questions or you want to be uh, signed up to to receive future notices about our events, you can email events at ntu.org. That's events at ntu.org. Uh, we should have an announcement in the coming weeks about a very exciting special guest for our next webinar, which will be Thursday, January seventh. Uh, until then, hope everyone has a wonderful and safe holiday season. That you have a happy new year. We will see you in 2021. Wendy, Jonathan, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.